Welcome everyone to another seminar of Physics Latin. Today we are very happy to have Aaron Pauti to talk about his recent findings on non-perturbative topological string theory on compact Calabiao manifolds from M-theory. Professor Pauti received his bachelor and master's degree from Oxford University and his PhD from the University of Sussex. He then held a SDFC postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Oxford and a Marie Curie fellowship at Ecole Polytechnique Paris. He went on the University of Heidelberg as a junior group leader, and then to the Max Planck Institute for Physics in Munich as a, lead, as a group leader. Uh, then he joined Ben Gurion University of the ne Neget as a faculty in 2019. He is known for his contribution in string theory, particularly in swap long program. He has worked extensively on the weak gravity conjecture, a theory, and a string phenomenology, uh, which explores connections between string theory and observable physics, including gauge symmetry breaking and cosmology. Uh, policy research also shed some lights on the implication of a string theory from early universe inflation and structure of the cosmos. We are very happy once again to have it with us today. Uh, please remember to raise your hand if you have any question during the talk, and uh, I leave you with Darren. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. And uh, thank you for the invitation and for the uh, opportunity to speak. Um, it's uh, it's very nice and uh, to be part of this program. And um, okay, so I'm going to uh, um, give uh, two lectures on two hours. Um, the the title of the talk is going to be uh, non perturbative um uh um yeah um topological strings um from m theory but um i should say that uh i will not uh, discuss um um, so much uh, strings, the topological string perspective. Uh, I'll talk a lot about uh, what is called the target space perspective. Um, so it might be a little bit deceptive in that sense, but uh, at the end, uh, it is all connected um, to topological strings. So um, the, the the what I want to describe eventually, uh, what I want to eventually get to is um, uh, the paper that I wrote, um, which is uh, 2408. Um, zero nine um, two five five, I think, um, with uh, my student uh, Javed Hatab, um, and uh, um, that's the research I want to get to. But uh, I will try to give the lectures in a pedagogical manner, um, so um, we'll only really get to this uh, to the new uh, research that we performed uh, later on. Um, so uh, uh, in, in fact, I'd, I'd like to give a little uh, plan for um, uh, a plan for the for the talk. So uh, I'm going to first of all give a very short um, intro uh, to 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 the, to the, to the status uh, of this of this question that we're trying to to understand and the to, to topological strings, um, and uh, and then I'm going to give uh, a slightly longer uh, introduction with with even more with a bit more details as with to the setting of the calculation that we're going to do. So this is like uh, so as to the calculation. Um, so. In the first introduction, there'll be very little detail. And then in the second one, still not full details. So if you don't manage to follow everything, that's okay. It's more to set the scene. And then the bulk of the talk will be uh, uh, a longish uh, calculation. And uh, essentially the paper that we, we wrote is, is about a calculation, but I will, I will do it from uh, completely the beginning and this will essentially just use uh, just use sort of uh, basic uh, textbook to, textbook textbook quantum field theory. 
Um, so that that will be the the the, the majority of the talk. Um, and uh, in many ways, this uh, long calculation will be eighty percent already known. Um, and so uh, it will lead to what are called the the Gubbekum of Afa uh, um, calculation and Gubbekum of Afa invariant. And so, in, in some sense, you can think of this lecture as eighty percent about an introduction to Gubbekum of Afa um, and Gubbekum of Afa invariants. Um, and that will hopefully uh, also be useful because I think in the future of this program, you'll also be hearing some lectures from a mathematical perspective on these ideas. So this will be the physics side. So this will be a very physics-y talk. Um, there will not be um, too much uh, advanced mathematics in it. So um, yeah, that's the plan. Um, again, I encourage people to uh, ask questions during the talk as much as, as, uh, as they would like. Um, so that'll be very nice. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll try to fit in as much as possible uh, in these two lectures. Okay. Is there any comments or questions before I start? Uh, I hope that this is okay. Maybe I can make my, can I make this a little bit? Is it better like this? Or... It's a little bit more precise. No, you know, let's go back to this. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so the, the very short, uh, so let's consider this very short introduction first. Uh, so uh, we're going to be thinking about string theory. So string theory is a, a theory of strings. Um, and uh, uh, the strings, uh, they trace out some world sheet uh, through space time. Like we can, we can think of this as a closed string propagating this way. And uh, on the world sheet uh, is a, a two dimensional uh, conformal field theory, and uh, this is a string theory. And then uh, topological strings uh, were basically uh, the idea that you put on the world sheet a topological field theory. Um, and the topological field theory just means you do a certain twist such that the, the theory is independent of um, uh, the metric on the world sheet. And this was, so this is, so the idea was to take a topological uh, field theory on the world sheet, um, and then that's essentially topological strings. And it was, uh, I think, first introduced in 1988 by by Witten, um, and then also uh, by Raff by Raffa in 1991, um, and. Uh, there were two types of uh, topological theories you could put on a wall sheet. There's the so-called uh, A model and the B model. Um, we'll be considering uh, uh, throughout this talk uh, completely only the what is called the topological string A model. Um, so it will not be uh, uh, so much of an issue for us. And uh, what does the A model do? Well, uh, the string is propagating in some space time. And for topological strings, this uh, space time, which is called a target space, uh, is going to be a Calabi-R manifold. So, uh, sorry. Uh, and in particular, it's going to be a Calabi-R threefold. So that means it has three complex dimensions. So it's a six dimensional um, uh, target space. And uh, what's going to happen, those strings are going to be on that background. And because it's a topological theory, it only really uh, is sensitive to very coarse information. And so it's essentially just going to give you information about, um, sorry, yeah, about maps from the uh, string world sheet. Okay, so this is the string world sheet uh, to the target space, which in this case is the Calabi-R. So here's the Calabi-R. And those maps are constrained to be holomorphic maps. 
that's not so important for us. We're not going to use it, but basically um, we're just mapping the uh, string wall sheet, which is some genus G Riemann surface um, to the Calabi out target space. And uh, this is in some sense, the simplest kind of string theory you can think of. Um, Okay, so uh, um, and uh, because of that, uh, we can do a lot of uh, calculations um, that we cannot do with a full string theory. Um, so that's the uh, that's the use that's the main use of topological strings. They're just essentially counting topological embeddings of the string wall sheet into the Calabi owl. Um, okay, um, are there any questions so far? Okay, so what I'm going to do now is start is, is to describe a little bit uh, the history of how these uh, um, strings are, can be uh, reinterpreted in terms of um, a kind of a target space perspective and a supergravity perspective, which is how which is what we're going to be using throughout this talk. So um, uh, basically, uh, sorry. Um, this uh, began. So this this was kind of early '90s. Uh, uh, late uh, late 80s, early 90s, and then in 1993 is kind of the next uh, main thing that happened. And um, the the these two papers, let me write them down. Sorry. Um, this is by the uh, Shatsky, Chicotti. Um, Uguri and Rafa, and then also uh, at the same time, this uh, important paper um, by Antoniadis, um, Gava, Lorraine, and Taylor. Uh, and so, what these uh, uh, papers showed. Uh, sort of what sector of the of a full type two a string theory is captured by topological strings? That's the kind of that's one way to think about this is sector of um, full type two a string theory is captured by topological strings, the so-called A model. And the way that one can think of it, one can phrase that is to think about um, uh, taking a string theory and thinking about the um, the supergravity that you would get as a low energy uh, theory of the string theory. So this would be some 10 dimensional supergravity theory. Um, and uh, the supergravity theory is going to have um, two derivative terms in it, but also many higher higher derivative terms in that theory. And uh, essentially, if you can reproduce all the high derivative operators or all the high dimension operators in your theory, you sort of reproduce in the full um, ultraviolet theory. Um, so um, what they uh, the way the way that this is phrased is that you can think of um, you can think of the type two a supergravity. Type two a supergravity, and in that supergravity, you will have terms that behave like the Ricci scalar, and then um, a certain field strength of a uh, photon um, of uh, of a gauge field called the Gravy photon. This is a gauge field in the in the theory in a the ten dimensional theory and they go up to uh, they can be counted up with a certain parameter g which we can call the genus and the reason that we call this the genus is that these terms in the effective action um, uh, correspond to scattering amplitudes of type 2a strings which have a wall sheet with the genus g okay so um what uh, so the way that this connects to topological strings is that we should just think of type 2a string theory, okay? And then um, we consider 
uh, the uh, scattering amplitude of type 2a strings and how this is captured in the low energy supergravity, a genus G scattering amplitude will give us um, this kind of a term in the effective supergravity action. And the claim is the topological strings um, calculate precisely um, those terms in the action, um, which behave like this, uh, these high derivative terms in the action of a particular gauge field and a particular uh, uh, Vichy scalar curvature. And that's what was shown in these papers. And this is essentially how we're going to phrase the whole problem of topological strings. We're going to think about uh, a 10 dimensional supergravity action, and we're going to think about these higher, um, uh, higher terms in, in the theory. I'm uh, sorry, uh, a four dimensional supergravity action. So we're thinking of, of this 10 dimensional type 2a supergravity, but we're going to put this on a Calabria manifold to get a four dimensional theory. Okay, this is very hand wavy. Like I said, it's going to get more and more explicit in detail later on, but this is just to start to see where, where we're going. Um, and now, once you rephrase topological string scattering amplitudes in terms of terms in the effective um, four dimensional supergravity, higher derivative terms, you can understand where the next, uh, 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 next uh, big step in the program was, which was in 1998. And that's uh, in this paper here by Gopakuma and Rafa. Okay, and what Gopakuma and Rafa showed is that um, you can think about these terms in effective action and you can uh, reproduce those terms by integrating out states in quantum field theory. So we know that if you integrate out um, uh, degrees, um, uh, momentum modes, let's say in quantum field theory, you get a renormalization. That means that you get uh, coefficients of operators changing. Uh, similarly, if you integrate out particles, they will modify the effective action in some way. And what you can do is you can look at these terms in the effective action, and you can ask how are they modified by integrating out states that are charged under this gauge field. And what Gubikam and Rafa showed is that um, you can uh, understand these terms uh, from uh, integrating out states. Um, okay, so we can say this like this. What they showed is that these terms in the action, they come from integrating out um, uh, certain M2 brains that are wrapping um, two cycles inside uh, the Calabria. And by integrating those states out, you can then calculate um, how the F, uh, um, how the coefficients of these terms, so if we call this F of G, how the F of G uh, depend on the uh, Calabria geometry. And as I told you, since these coefficients are also the coefficients that correspond to topological string scattering amplitudes or just to uh, physical string scattering amplitudes, that means that by doing, but if you can figure out how these coefficients behave from integrating out the states, you can figure out how the topological string um, amplitudes behave. And that's basically uh, the insight that they had. And then finally, uh, um, uh, uh, that's that's basically where things are. And then finally, we'll talk about our paper where we um, showed that by integrating out these states, you also get more information than was originally considered. You get also non-perturbative uh, topological string uh, amplitude um, uh, uh, information out of it. So, so in our paper, we propose that um, uh, integrating out um, the M2s gives uh, non-perturbative um, information on the topological string. OK, so that's the overview of the field and where we're at. I mean, it's OK if you didn't follow it, but it was just to set the setting, uh, because um, we'll now start to do things much more explicitly. Um, but I wanted to give this little uh, introduction of, of the field. So now, uh, are there any questions about this uh, very hand wavy uh, status of the field uh, setting? This one's better.
sorry. And on the air conditioning and such. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so now we're going to start uh, discussing um, what the actual calculation is and what the actual setting is. Okay, so uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, slightly more detailed introduction. Um, so what we're going to consider is type 2a string theory. Again, this is only still an introduction. Um, I just want to set the scene for what we're trying to calculate. And then in the third part of the talk, which is going to be 90% of the talk, I'm going to actually go through the calculation. And then we'll start just from quantum field theory textbook level. So if you're not quite following this, that's OK. Um, but uh, it's important to set the setting for why is it that we're calculating what we're going to try and calculate. So we're going to consider type 2a string theory on this background. So just R4 times a Calabi-Yau threefold. And um, in terms of that we're going to think about this four-dimensional this four-dimensional uh, theory here. And this solution, this is a solution of type 2a string theory. And it preserves um, n equals two supersymmetry in four dimensions. Okay, so uh, we can think about a four-dimensional um, uh, n equals two supersymmetric theory um, associated to this background. And what is this uh, four-dimensional theory going to have? Let's look at the type of fields that we're going to get here. So in the 10 dimensional, in 10 dimensions, we have 10 dimensional fields that follow in. This is a type 2a string theory. There is a gauge field, um, which we'll call a1 of mu. Um, and then uh, this 10 dimensional gauge field will just give rise to a four dimensional gauge field, which we'll call a0 mu. Okay, this is the, this is the called the Ramon Ramon uh, uh, one form that type 2a string theory has. Type 2a string theory also has a Ramon Ramon three form. Okay, it has three indices. And you can take, uh, oops, how do I undo this? Um, sorry. Three form. And you can take uh, one of those indices to be, one of those indices to be a four dimensional index and the other two to be um, internal indices, so along uh, the calabi yau and therefore uh, this gives rise again to gauge fields in four dimensions, and there's going to be a number of them according to how the two the internal two dimensions, the internal two indices are embedded in the calabi yau We'll write down how many there are in a minute. Um, and then there's going to be other type of fields, they're not going to be so important for us, but one thing that's important is the string coupling. That's a field in string theory. It's called the dilaton. And that's going to give rise to also some scalar in four dimensions, a scalar field. It's a scalar field in 10 dimensions, it's then set for a scalar field in four dimensions. OK? There's other things we want to uh, uh, add. Uh, in particular, um, there's going to be uh, the metric uh, so the 10 dimensional metric, uh, maybe I should write this. Yeah, let me just, sorry. Let me write the all, all in one, one line. So G string is going to give rise to a field phi. Then we have the, uh, the metric uh, in 10 dimensions and we can give it internal legs. Uh, so that's the internal components of the metric. So that means it's going, it's going to give rise to a scalar field in uh, four dimensions. It only has uh, all the legs of the met, all the indices are taken internal inside the calabi -Yau. Um And there is also the Nova Schwartz two form, which is anti symmetric. And again, you can take it to have all the legs inside the calabi -Yau, So it's going to give rise to a scalar, which we'll call the BI. And this uh, sector here. Um, will form together an n equals two vector multiplet. Okay, so, so that means that they are super partners. They transform into each other under supersymmetry. And the number of such multiplets that we'll need, that we'll have is given by the number of two cycles that we have in the 
uh, Calabial. So they are counted by B2 of the Calabial. We can see that because let's say if we look at this, um, is this? No. Uh, sorry. Yeah, because this is a three form. And so to get a vector field, we should reduce it all on a two cycle. So we should integrate it over a two cycle. So the number of gauge fields that we get from the single 10 dimensional three form is given by the number of two cycles that we have in the Calabial. Okay, so that's basically the number of two dimensional holes we have in the Calabial. Um, so um, if you like, you can think of them as spheres, um, but they can also have higher genus. So these are n equals two vector multiplets. And these two scalars, since they are sitting in the same multiplet, we should combine them. We can naturally combine them into a single complex field, which um, let me write this more centrally. Uh, sing single complex field, which we'll call Ti, that's going to be Vi plus I Vi. Okay. And um, this is a scalar field that is part of the vector multiplets in four dimensions. Um, and it's going to be uh, crucial uh, for our um, setting. Are there any questions so far on this? Um, okay, so um, okay, what about these other guys here? Uh, so uh, this A0 mu, that's going to sit in what's called a gravitational multiplet. There's only one of these. So that means that includes the four-dimensional uh, graviton. And then that's going to be sitting in the multiplet with this. Um, uh, well, it's not going to be quite A0 mu. This would be important. Uh, with what we call V mu and uh, some other things that are not so important. And uh, V mu is what's called the gravity photon. Gravity photon. And that's going to be some combination of the A, uh, A zero mu and the AI mu. Okay. So we're going to take some combination of these guys. That's going to be a photon in four dimensions. And that's what we call the gravity photon. That's going to be the superpartner of the graviton under the n equals two supersymmetry. Uh, so I runs from sorry, I runs from one up to the second Betty number of the Calabial. So it counts the number of two-dimensional cycles in the Calabial. And mu is a four-dimensional index. So mu, sorry, um, I should write this. Uh, mu runs from one to four, that's what we mean. So we have a, a graviton and uh, gauge fields. Yeah. So the, in the four dimensional theory, we have very many uh, gauge fields because we start from a single three, three form in higher dimensions, we reduce it on many, many two cycles. So we get many, many gauge fields in the four dimensional theory. And um, one of them, one combination of them is called the gravity photon. It's the super partner of the graviton under n equals two supersymmetry. Um, okay. Are there any questions about this so far? Okay. It's okay if this is hard to follow. Again, it's not going to be the core of the calculation, but we're starting to see more details of the setting in which what we're going to be doing. Um, so uh, let us set some notation. So we have this in the four dimensional theory, we have many fields AI and left denote by FI. Okay, Fi is going to be the field strength um, of, which goes from zero up to uh, the, the second betting number of the Calabial um, is going to be the field strength of the AIs. So these are going to be the field strengths of the AIs. So I is uh, like the little i. So if you like, I is... Um, uh, zero and the little i. So we, we pair them all up. So we, we, we fix them all up together. And uh, w mu nu is going to be the field strength 
of the gravity photon v mu. Okay, so I'm saying w mu nu is del mu v nu minus del nu v mu. So uh, w mu is then some combination of the f i mu because there's one more of them here. So um, uh, w nu is some combination of the f i mu nu. What combination that is, is determined by the supersymmetry of the background that we have. Um, okay, so that's the setting. So we, we, let me recap. We're considering type 2a string theory. Um, we are uh, type 2a string theory. This two type 2 on this background, r4 times Calabria threefold. Um, we have a three form in 10 dimensions. By integrating it over two cycles, we get a gauge field in four dimensions. Okay. Since there are many two cycles in the Calabria, we get many such gauge fields. And these pair up into vector multiplets, like so. Um, these are then the scalars of the vector multiplets. They will play a crucial role for us. Um, and we also have one additional gauge field, um, and uh, which we call A0. And if we pair them, if you fit them all up into these kind of AIs with this capital I index, then there is a gravity photon, which is some combination of these AIs. And that gravity photon is a super partner of the graviton. Um, okay. Now, uh, the uh, four dimensional theory has n equals two supersymmetry. So that means there are uh, two supersymmetry parameters, um, i equals one and two. And uh, we uh, can then um, fit uh, um, uh, fit these uh, component fields, TIs, the TIs and the AIs into a single uh, superfield. Okay, that's a superfield notation. We're not going to be using it very much, but just to get a kind of uh, to define a problem, we should at least abstractly uh, introduce them. Um, so what we do is we actually uh, um, we introduce what are called the XIs. These have a big I. And uh, the relation to the TIs is that the TI is the X little i with X zero. Okay, so remember big I is ranges of zero and I. Okay, so these are just um, uh, a way to parameterize these scalar fields TI in the vector multiplets. Um, and then we have the superfield associated to the superfield, which is, we can call this uh, with a curly xi. That's going to have the xi, which are scalar fields as lowest components. And then it's going to have some higher components. And then we're going to be using this, the notation um, uh, uh, I, should, I should probably set the, the notation we're going to be using is of this paper. Um, 7108 here, which is the, the crucial, this is going to be the paper we're going to be following the notation for most of the talk um, by uh, Witten and Dudashenko. Um, and in their notation, uh, they write the superfields like this. Um, and uh, this is multiplying Uh, this combination of the gravity photon, the xi's, and the fi's, where the minus means it's anti-self dual field strength. So that means that, in particular, w minus means that uh, the one two components is equal to uh, minus the three four components. This is going to be important for us. Um, that's what we mean by this minus on the w's. And then there are also uh, the gravitational multiplets, which sits on the fruit superfield that we'll, we'll call, we'll write like this. And this has in it, uh, remember the gravity photon. It's a multiplet of a field strength. And then also some um, parts of the uh, 
uh, of the Ricci scalar, actually the anti-self dual Ricci scalar. Now, it's not important really what these superfields are. All we, all we need to see here is that this superfield has in it the Xi's, which are related to Ti's, and then it has this field strength for the vectors. That's what I said, that they are sitting in the same vector multiplet. So in here we have this uh, um, uh, vector multiplets in here. And then here we have the gravity photon. Oh, sorry, how do I undo this? Yeah, the gravity photon in this field strength. gravity photon, and here we have uh, the Ricci, uh, the Riemann tensors, that tells us that there's the multiplet which has the graviton in it, and what we call the gravity photon, which is uh, uh, the V. Okay, so they sit into superfields. It's not going to be important for us, but it will let us define the core object that we're interested in. Um, so what we're interested in now is the four-dimensional action the four-dimensional action. And the action is going to be given in superspace uh, language, like so. It has a particular certain terms called F terms that I'm going to be writing down. And it looks like this. Just write this. So I can make this. Um, oh, okay. This is the gravity photon. Uh, these are superfields. Um, the G R. Uh, and here we have a superspace integration like like this. Um, but we can perform this uh, integration, and we. After we do the superspace integration, we'll get two types of terms, uh, the so-called genus greater than one terms, which are going to look like this. It has they're going to have this uh, r minus squared in them, and uh, the gravity photon field strength will be two g minus two, and then it's going to be the genus zero terms, um, which are going to give rise to the uh, kinetic terms for the TIs, um, as well as the kinetic terms for the um, field strengths of the vectors. Okay, uh, so these are precisely the terms that I, these terms are the terms that in my introduction I said um, the supergravity uh, has these terms. Uh, here, okay. So these are the higher these are the terms in the effective supergravity action that have uh, a Ricci scalar and higher powers of the gravity photon, and the coefficients are these fgs, and they are functions of the scalar fields in the vector multiplets, um, the ti's as appearing through these um, big uh, xi, and since this is the action, we can define the uh, um, uh, log of the action uh, as uh, uh, so if we define f uh, which is the sum of fg and then the gravity photon um, to the g like this so we can define this object which is a combination of the f's and the gravity photons um, this is uh, the action, so that's log of the partition function. And then for that reason, we call this the free energy. Uh, it's just a name, okay? And this is what we call the uh, topological string free energy, okay? From the target space perspective. So like I told you, the way we should think of it is like this. You do two topological string scattering, that scattering will give rise to uh, um, is uh, that scattering can be produced by certain terms in the effective four dimensional action. These are precisely these terms here. That's what these terms are here. 
The coefficients are therefore determining the topological string uh, um, uh, uh, scattering. And so um, if we look at this combination here, that's given us some data about topological strings. That's called the topological string three energy. That's the target space definition of the topological string three energy. Okay. Um, and that's why we're only going to be using this kind of target space uh, perspective. So another way to think of it is that you can even forget about topological strings and you can ask, um, how do we calculate these higher derivative terms in the four-dimensional supergravity? And that has interest in itself. Um, that's going to be the problem we're going to try and solve. Uh, we're going to try and understand how to calculate these coefficients of these terms in the four-dimensional action for type 2a string theory on a calabial. The name of those terms is also the topological string three energy. Um, so that's um, what we're going to try and calculate. So are there any questions about that? Um, okay. Um, so there is some conversion factor. So just to make this make this conversion very precise. So conversion to topological string free energy, um, to make it more precise, we need to identify this W squared, which is the um, gravity photon uh, field strength squared. We, we identify that with um, minus, there is some factor of four over pi squared that um, is just conventions, uh, just do without conventions, uh, with this parameter lambda, and lambda is what's called the topological string coupling. And then the topological string free energy um, is just uh, sorry, this is f. It's a function of these ti's and this lambda. And it's just given by this, this forms here. Okay, so that's basically this thing here. Um, it's exactly the same. It's just the equivalent to the supergravity one. Once we identify the gravity photon field strength with the uh, topological string coupling. Okay, so that's going to be what we want to try and uh, calculate. And what do these things look like for Calabial? Uh, what they look like is basically uh, there is a genus zero part and that can, that's going to look like some polynomial piece that starts from some T cubed. Um, it has some polynomial contribution. That's not going to be important for us. And then it's going to have some sum over exponential uh, exponential contributions that are, that are exponentially small in these uh, scalar fields T of the vector multiplets. And those are the things that people are most interested to try and understand. Sometimes we call these uh, world sheet instantons. And these are the uh, coefficients of these exponentials are what uh, we, we, like, we would like to calculate uh, uh, in topological spring computations. Um, and they're gonna be related to uh, what are called the Gubicum of alpha invariants um, um, with, as, as we'll describe in, in, in a bit. And then there's these uh, other term, there's uh, other kind of, uh, uh, sorry, um, the higher genus ones. Uh, well, the genus one one has also some polynomial piece in it. Um, and then also these sum of exponentials. And then the higher genus ones um, only have exponentials in them. With some coefficients something like that. Um, so that's what these things look like. And what you want to calculate in topological string theory is basically these coefficients, uh, the coefficients in front of the exponential. So you forget about the top about the polynomial terms and you would like to calculate what these coefficients are. Um, and that's what uh, uh, essentially we call Gubicum of alpha invariance uh, after some uh, reshuffling of these exponentials. Okay, so we can think of these coefficients as either appearing in the supergravity effective action or as coming from topological string uh, free energy. Um, and uh, 
now comes the inside of Gupakuma Rafa. What they said is that if we think of these coefficients, of these terms as appearing in the four dimensional effective action, then we can think of them as coming from integrating out um, certain states uh, uh, in the theory. So let's understand what is it that they were um, uh, integrating out and uh, what were they trying to do. So what they said was this. Uh, so an example of integrating out a field is like, say, if you take QED and you integrate out the electron, okay, what does that mean? So if, if you take QED and you integrate out the electron, okay, then you get a theory just of the uh, gauge field. And if you do this in a background, so-called background computation, which is called a background, um, uh, uh, a constant background, the background of which is constant for the photon, that means that essentially f mu mu equals a constant for the photon, then you get an effective uh, uh, theory, um, an effective Lagrangian, which, which just depends on these f's because the electron has been integrated out. And that Lagrangian is called the Euler-Heisenberg Lagrangian. Okay, and what does it look like? Well, it has some f squared piece, which is like the tree level, which is coming from the tree level uh, QED kinetic term. And then it has higher powers of uh, the uh, photon field strength, which is coming from uh, diagrams like this in QED, where you have an electron running in a loop, and after you integrate out the electron, then that's going to give you in the effective theory some term which captures this physics. And that term will behave like F squared because it has two photons in it, like this. And this term would then be a loop of an electron which has four photons coming out. And this term would be a loop of an electron which has six photons coming out, and so on and so on. And this way you get many, many such uh, terms in the effective action which have higher powers of the field strength of the photon. Okay, this is textbook material, and I recommend uh, the book of uh, uh, Schwartz. Um, I think it's called. Uh, Quantum field theory, quantum field theory, um, and uh, the standard model, which has an excellent treatment of this uh, this this thing. So, in other words, if you integrate out a charged particle coupled to a gauge field, you will get an effective action which has higher which has higher derivatives high, uh, higher powers in infinite numbers of powers of the field strength of the photon that come from integrating out this one loop diagram okay i hope this is clear any questions about this um, okay so then what gubakov said he said okay now let's integrate out some charged states we'll talk about what those charged states are that are charged under the gravity photon background Okay, if you integrate them out, then what will you get? You will get all these kind of higher powers now in the gravity photon background, like this. Okay, after you integrate out these charged states, just like if you integrate out the electron in QED. And then they said, well, look, those, st those terms in the action, they're exactly these terms here that we're interested in calculating. Right? These are exactly these terms with higher powers of the W that we're interested in calculating. Um, sorry, here. Higher powers of W. And so they said, integrate out those states, and they will calculate for you all these different powers of W, and then uh, read off the coefficients that you get, and that's how you can calculate the, um, uh, the coefficients of those terms. And those are precisely what we call the... Um, um, so if, if you write this generally, uh, yeah, we can write this as uh, Fg, Wg, 2G. So that's how you calculate them from integrating out some charged states. Now we'll explain why, why did they get this idea and why does that work? Are there any questions about how you can then, you, you, can, you can view integrating out state as calculating for you these coefficients? Um, okay, so which states to integrate out? You have to integrate, out states that are charged under the gravity photon. 
And the only such states um, that are charged are wrapped D brains. So in particular, so the charged states that you have to integrate out in this type 2a string theory are, are wrapped D2 brains on the two cycles on the two cycles um, uh, associated to the TIs. Remember, the TIs come from uh, vector multiplets associated to two cycles in the Calabial. And essentially, the TIs give you the size of this two cycle, the size of the two cycle. So you wrap a brain on this two cycle. You then integrate it out. It will generate for you higher terms in the action in the gravity photon field strength that will depend on the mass of the brain. But the mass of the brain is given by the size of the two cycle, which is just the t's. So that's how you will get this t dependence here in these f of g's. And that way you can calculate what those are. That's the idea of Gruber, Kummer, and Raffa. And why do they say that that should work? Um, uh, the reason that should work is that uh, they made the following uh, argument. Um, so let me just uh, give some more notation. So these D2 brains, um, let's, let's take uh, the charge of these states. What are they going to be? So these are going to be particles in four dimensions. The D2 brains wrap in two cycles. So they're like a particle in four dimensions. Uh, they're wrapping two cycles in the Calabial. And there's uh, I labels the number of two cycles. And so they're going to have a charge, which is given by beta i, some integers, which is just how many times they wrap the two cycle associated to the index i. OK, so that's going to be like one, two, three, up to the number of two cycles you have. You can wrap it n times or beta times. And beta i tells you how many times you wrap it. That gives you the charge of the particle in four dimensions that's given by the d2 brain wrapping these two cycles. But what you consider is not just a D2 brain, but a D2 D0 bound state, a bound state of D2 D0 brains. And the number of D0s that you have in the bound state is also an integer, which is, gives you a charge. In fact, that gives you the charge. This gives you the charge under what are called the A mu i's. And then there is another integer n, which gives you the charge under the A0 um, that we talked about. Okay, and that is the number of D0 bound states that you have. So this thing is the wrapping number geometrically, the wrapping number of the D2 on a two cycle. And this thing is the number of D0 bounds, bound states that you have with a D2. It's the number of D0s you have there. So that describes us the charge states. Okay, there is a charge matrix, there's a charge vector, and it gives us the charge of these states under the fields fi these are the gauge fields. these are the field strengths that we had fi's okay so that's the charges of the particles under the fi's in the supergravity and those charges have an interpretation in terms of d2 d0 states as the wrapping number of the d2 and the number of d0 bound states so that's the uh the 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 calculation that that gruber Kummer, and Raffa did okay they integrate out these charge states. They generate for us terms in the effective action, which look like uh, W squared, W4 squared, W6. They then read off the coefficients of those terms. And those are precisely the genus G uh, contributions to the free energy, the FGs here. Um, okay, now why should this calculation work? Why should it be that if we integrate out the wrapped brains, they will uh, give us um, the, the contributions to the uh, action in the gravity photon. And what they said was the following. They said, so this is the Gruber Kummer Raffa reasoning. Gruber Kummer Raffa. What they said was um, imagine uh, if we take lambda small, take lambda small. Then we know that uh, um, uh, we they consider the following. They say take lambda small, and if you think of, if you actually do it a bit more precisely than what I explained, you should really think of lambda as something like the string coupling times some kind of times a, a sort of gravity photon background. Not exactly W that we had before, 
but uh, a relation of it. So there is a factor of this string coupling here um, as well, because it, as I told you, uh, 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 it's a genus G amplitude, so it has a, a factor of uh, the string coupling to the power of 2G in it. And then what they said was, you can think of this, you can send G string to infinity. That means you go to strong string coupling, but you also send W's, this W tilde to zero, such that you're still at weak coupling. In that case, if you send the string coupling to infinity, what does this imply? This implies that uh, D2, D0 states become lighter, lighter than the fundamental string. Okay, that's because D brains have a mass D brains have a mass that goes like the string scale over G string, whilst the fundamental string has a mass which goes like M string. And so if G string is going to infinity, they become lighter than the string. They're the light states in your theory. They dominate the effective action. If you integrate them out, they give you the leading contribution. In fact, they give you the full contribution to these uh, terms in effective action. And that's why those are the relevant, uh, that is the relevant calculation to do. Okay, you just integrate out those brains and that's how you get these terms in the action. And from when you get the terms in the action from integrating brains out, you can read off the topological string free energy. Um, now there is a relation here to M theory. That's what I mentioned M theory, because if we send G string to infinity, then that means that type 2A string theory is going to M theory. That's what M theory is. It's strongly coupled type to a string theory. And so we should not really think of it necessarily as D2, D0 brains wrapping two cycles in the Calabi-Yau. So here we have D2, D0s, but we're doing this in a strongly coupled setting. And that's going to an M2 brain wrapping the two cycle, which has N Kaluta Klein momenta, uh, momenta along the M theory circle. Okay, so this is the relation between type 2A string theory and M theory. You go to strong coupling, uh, strong coupled 2A string theory is like M theory, and uh, M theory is 11 dimensional, so you can think of it as the 10 dimensions of type 2A plus a circle. The D2, D0 brains that we have are going to now M2 brains of M theory, and the D0 chart, and the B, so the beta i is the wrapping number of the M2. And the ends are going to be the Kaluta Klein momentum of the M2 along this circle. That's the, that's the interpretation we should be considering because we're thinking of doing this integrating our calculation at strong coupling. Okay. So, in other words, Gubikov and Rapper said integrate out M2 brains on the Calabi Yau with N units of Kaluta Klein momentum. When you do that, you will generate in the four dimensional action these uh, W square terms here. And then from that, you can read off the uh, topological string free energy. Um, and then you can get off these, uh, get all these exponentials and the coefficients you will get are then going to be um, integers as we will show. Okay, so that's uh, basically the end of my uh, long introduction. Uh, that's what uh, Grupa Kumarafa uh, approach to topological string amplitudes is. Um, from a target space perspective. So I'll just repeat it very quickly and then we'll take a break. Um, so let me repeat what I just said in my this introduction. And then from now on, I'm going to be doing just a quantum field theory calculation of integrating out charged states. That's what we need to try and do. And that I will do in a lot more detail. Um, so let me explain. We have the what we call the topological, let me recap, string free energy. Okay, so this is um, F, which is FG. It's a function of these moduli, uh, of these vector multiple moduli TI, which we can think of as, as measuring the sizes of two cycles, like this. And we want to calculate these FGs. That's what we're trying to do, okay? These are mapped to uh, terms in the action of the type of the four-dimensional supergravity, which look, again, exactly the same as like FG, but now they have a, a gravity photon field strength uh, like this. So you can read them off from the effective action. And then we know that that's the Gubikov-Raffa idea is that if you integrate out 
D2, D0 uh, type 2A states, or if you like, uh, M2 brains in M theory, they will generate for you uh, these kind of doubly square terms. Basically, you just consider a loop and you can have, let's say, uh, you know, four external Ws like this or a loop with just two external Ws, okay? They will generate these terms for you. And this way, you can read off the FGs. So in other words, to calculate the topological spring of free energy, all you need to do is integrate out particles charged under gauge fields. That's the uh, idea of Gubakoma and Vapa. And uh, basically, uh, since you're integrating out, um, yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, the Gubakoma Vapa invariants will turn out just to be the number of such particles that you're integrating out. And that's why they're integers, uh, as we'll show. So what we want to do now, and for the rest of the lecture and the next lecture, is just to perform this calculation. We just want to integrate out, integrate out charged particles um, uh, and calculate um, the uh, terms in the effective action which go like w squared, w to the four, w to the six. And that's gonna give us the FGs, which give us the uh, topological string free energy. That's what we want to try and calculate. Okay, are there uh, any questions about this? Okay, so I suggest that we take, is it a 10 minute break you usually take or? Uh, should we take a break? Is it uh, Daniel? Uh, yeah, it can be uh, five or ten minutes. Okay, so what I want to do now is explain um, how to integrate out uh, charged fields. Because essentially, the calculation that Gubik and Rafa did, and calculation that we will we want to do in our paper, is just an integrating out calculation of charge fields um, in uh, uh, four dimensions um, under um, uh, this gravity photon, which is just going to be a, a gauge field. So we just want to integrate out charge fields. That's all we want to do. We want to calculate the effective action you get from integrating out charge fields. So this is actually textbook quantum field theory calculation, but we will do it in a lot of details. Um, uh, well, as much as I'll be able to in the time permitting, because essentially that's all that one needs to really do. Um, again, I think the book of, of Schwartz is excellent for this, uh, um, for this calculation. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears and just talk about sort of basic quantum field theory. So hopefully it will be more familiar. Um, so the integrating out, um, integrating out is going to be done using the Schwinger formalism, um, and it goes like this. Uh, so let's consider scalar QED. Okay, that's everybody's favorite simple uh, theory. It has a charged particle charged under a gauge field. Um, so scalar QED has a four act, a four dimensional action like this. So it has a uh, field strength, the photon field strength, and then we just add a charge scalar um, to this action. Um, and uh, D is, uh, so D squared is just D mu, D mu, and uh, D mu is um, del mu plus I, E, A mu. Okay, so now we want to integrate out uh, phi, integrate out phi uh, to get an effective action, an effective action which depends on, uh, on A, okay? Remember what we're doing is we're trying to calculate these terms like F squared, F to the four, F to the six from integrating out a charged particle. 
that's that's the calculation we need to do to extract these uh, coefficients. So what we want to do is we want to consider, let's say, in the path integral, we have a path integral for this action which has uh, phi and a in it. Okay, and here is the uh, the scalar QED action we just wrote above here. Um, and uh, we now we then basically want to do we we'll perform the integration over the phi field so that we just get an action which just depends on the A. And this is what we call the effective action. Okay, are there any questions about this? Oh, I hope this is familiar. Um, okay, that's what we call the effective action. And um, we want to just do these calculations. Uh, so, uh, this integration out is not it's quite easy to do because the action is only quadratic in the phi's. Okay, so it's just a Gaussian integral. Um, and we can do it even exactly. Um, so we're just going to use um, uh, this, this thing here. Okay, so if we have any matrix, uh, any operator M, like this, then we could just use the identity uh, that this is equal to um, uh, this is equal to this, uh, where m is some operator. In our case, uh, m is uh, uh, in our case m is just uh, minus p squared plus m squared, and uh, n is uh, it's actually an infinite uh, normalization constant. Okay, this is uh, you can see this in any textbook. Uh, you look up uh, this expression, uh, how to form the Gaussian integral. Um, and so, if we do this for our QED action, for our scalar QED action, then the effective action that we get is just going to be. Um, the original uh, f squared that we have in the QED action. That's this f squared here. And then we're going to get this contribution from this phi star m phi. Uh, and so that's going to give us uh, a log, log of this thing here. So it's going to be my, uh, sorry, um, minus log n. And then uh, minus log, and then the determinant of this uh, operator, which in our case is just minus t squared plus m squared. And um, remember, we can write um, uh, minus log of the determinant of this thing. Uh, that's the same as minus the trace of log of the determinant of log of the operator. Okay, so tracing means tracing over the eigenvalues of that operator. In this case, they are basically the um, uh, energy uh, level associated with that operator. Uh, but we can do the tracing on any basis, in fact, we'll do it in a second. Um, I hope this is uh, familiar. Um, and now, uh, what we want to do now is we want to use uh, Schwinger's formula. Schwinger's formula, which uh, lets us write this is uh, uh, write an operator as an integral, and it, I mean it's very simple really. Um, we, we just write it like this, uh, and in our case, a is. Uh, minus d squared minus m squared. Okay, if you do this integral, then you're just gonna pull up essentially one over a and it's gonna give you this. Uh, so this is the kind of integral representation, Schwing is the integral representation of an operator. And so if we uh, just uh, use this, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, we want to use that. So. Uh, to use that, what we're going to do is we're going to take this. Uh, we're going to take this thing here, trace of the log, and we'll take a derivative of this with respect to m squared. Okay, 
So we're going to consider uh, d by the m squared, d by the m squared of minus trace log minus d squared minus m squared, like this. That's just trace one over minus d squared minus m squared. And now this looks like this form here, one over a. Okay, and so we can use Schringer's formula to write trace one over one minus d squared minus m squared equals minus i integral zero to infinity ds e to the minus i s m squared trace e to the minus i h s. So all we did was just uh, um, put this uh use this formula here so we have e to the i s a and then a is minus d squared minus m squared so we took the m squared out and then we have a hamiltonian what we call the hamiltonian which is just d squared and we have to trace over the eigenvalues of of d squared um uh over the, the functions okay and uh, this doesn't quite give us what we want because this gives us only the derivative with respect to m squared of what we're trying to calculate. So to get what we're trying to calculate, we just better integrate back over m squared. Okay, so uh, that means that we just have to do this integration. So then, in other words, the trace of the log of minus d squared minus m squared is then just the integral and of m squared in this. Integrating with respect to m squared is just going to give us a one over s here, so that's just going to give us minus integral zero to infinity ds over s e to the minus i s m squared, and then we have to do this trace over this Hamiltonian. Okay, now to perform the trace, we can do it in a position basis or an energy basis or momentum basis as we wish. We can do it in position basis by um, uh, just putting in a, a complete set uh, of the eigenstates so we can perform the trace um, in position space. So that just means that uh, where we have trace, we just write integral d4x, and then we put the uh, complete set of position basis um uh, function wave fun uh, eigenfunctions and so in other words this is just equal to minus integral zero to infinity ds over s e to the minus i s m squared integral d4x and then we have to uh, put in this complete basis here like so and so now we just get this integral dx which is what uh we have for the um uh, the action and so um, this is our effective action that we're calculating, remember. This whole thing is our effective action. This is what we're calculating, contribution to the effective action. And so the uh, contribution to the effective action, so this, this is going to give us a contribution to the effective Lagrangian, which is just L effective, which is just going to be this without the D4X. Um, and uh, the I factor, so. Okay, and that's, uh, this is the important result. And that's how Schwinger integrated out a particle. Okay, so we just integrate phi, all we did was perform the path integral over phi star to get to an effective action. It's just a Gaussian integral. And we wrote this effective action from integrating out phi star um, as uh, uh, in this way. And this is called the Schwinger representation and the parameter S that we're integrating over is called the Schwinger proper time. Okay, and um, uh, yeah, so this is all in textbooks uh, if you want to look it up at some point. Are there any questions about this? No. Um, Okay, the dependence on A comes because H, uh, which is D squared, is just going to be, well, the momentum, and then it's going to, because it's covariant derivative, 
it will depend on A. So that's where the gauge field dependence in this effective Hamiltonian, in this effective Lagrangian is. And that's going to, we'll see, give us all powers, high powers of the gauge field or the gauge field field strength. And that's how we're going to read off the coefficients. Um, okay. Okay, so now we, we, we just want to do this same calculation, which is the general quantum field theory calculation, integrating our charged particle, but in this background, um, uh, which is going to be this, uh, now we're going to do the same, but in the background, which is R4 times the Calabi-Yau. And we want to consider a background where there is a constant gravity fault and uh, imagine itself dual film strength. That's the calculation we need to do. And we want to extract the coefficients in front of the powers of the W of the gravity photon field strength that we get. Um, now, more precisely, we want to do this calculation in an M theory background, which is an 11 dimensional background like this. Um, uh, again, with the same thing. Um, and so uh, the first thing we need to we notice is that we have. Uh, we want to do the calculation in R4, not in Minkowski space. And so what we need is basically the Euclidean version of uh, the calculation we just did. Okay, that's easy uh, to do. I'm just going to write it down. It's basically the same thing. So the effective Lagrangian, but now in the Euclidean version, is going to be minus. It just doesn't have the I, uh, essentially, uh, uh, here. These eyes disappear if you do it in Euclidean background, but the rest of it stays the same. Okay. And um, we need to do the calculation for uh, a gravity photon, a constant gravity photon background. Okay, so uh, when we integrate out of this field, we have to take this gauge field to have a background where the field strength is constant. That's exactly the calculation we're instructed to do. Integrate out a charge field in a constant gravity photon background, and then read off the coefficients from the effective action that you get when you do that. Now, now things become very uh, subtle, um, and uh, this is uh, essentially uh, some subtleties that um, uh, are going to be important uh, also for our research paper. And uh, to do this, we need to do the integrating out in a background, uh, in a gravity photon background. Uh, which is uh, a supersymmetric solution um, of the uh, five-dimensional theory, of this uh, theory on S1 times R4 times Calabi-Yau. Um, and this solution was, was found, um, it's, it's in HEPTH uh, 0209114, um, but uh, the discussion we're going to do is basically following, again, this uh, paper of uh, Dudashenko and Witten, which is this paper here. Uh, Dudashenko and Witten. Like this. Um, okay. And this is the solution that we're going to be calculating it in. So it looks like this. This is the solution. Oh, I'll write it out first. This is the solution found in this paper here. Um, so uh, this is a solution in Minkowski 1,4 which has coordinates t and x mu. But uh, as explained in this paper by the Shinko and Witten, that's not really quite what we want. Um, uh, but well, let me write first of all what this v mu is, uh, sorry, in this solution. So v mu is one half t minus mu mu x mu. So now we see that uh, v is linear. And so the derivative of v, the field strength, is just constant. So this is this constant gravity photon background. This is the gravity photon. Okay, and it's anti-self-dual. So that means that um, 
this you get minus itself. Um, now uh, t importantly is real and constant in this solution. So that's the solution in Minkowski space that was found uh, in this paper here by um, Gondlet et al. Now, what we need is not a solution on M1 comma four, but we need a solution on S1 times R4. And to do that, we need to do Euclidean rotation of the time coordinate. So to do that, we need to do a Euclidean rotation of the time coordinate. So now we uh, uh, not in now we have this S1 um, and not in, and we also need to compactify it. Okay, so we, we identify uh, uh, we, we identify the y coordinate, and so sigma is what we call the circle radius. That's the circle radius of the S1. And so if we put this change of coordinate into the metric, we found we find this metric here. So this is the background we want to uh, uh, do the calculation in and the integrating out calculation. And uh, we have this, uh, because uh, the important point is this, because here we have V, which is real, but then we take T to be I Y. So we have a factor of I here, and then we factor it outside this T squared. And so we get a factor of I now multiplying the V. And so that's why the, the vector, the gravity photon field, which appears in this background is actually I times V. And since V was real, now uh, we see that B mu is imaginary. And so is, uh, um, if we, uh, Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. I, I, didn't, I didn't explain this well. Sorry. This metric must be real. We need this metric to be real. Okay. We don't want to work in a complex space time. So that means that this thing must be real. So beam U real implies that we have to take the gravity photon imaginary. That's the important point. And so the gravity photon field strength must also be imaginary. So the calculation we need to do is not just integrating out a particle in the background constant uh, uh, field strength, but we need to integrate out a charged particle in the background, which is a constant imaginary field strength for the gauge field. Okay, that's the uh, that's the crucial point. That's it's it's a crucial point. Um, and that subtlety is going to be very important for uh, understanding the effective action that we get. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's an important uh, setting that I wanted to explain. Okay, so uh, let's now specify. So here we did an integrating our calculation, but to do that, we need to, uh, we need uh, in H, which is D squared, we need to work out precisely the covariant derivative and then put that into here and we'll get the effective action. So let's work out the covariant derivative for the particles we want to integrate out here. So let's work out the charges of the particles under the gravity photon. Okay, charges of the particles under the gravity photon. Um, so, uh, Remember, QI determined our charges under the two cycles and the D0 charge, and then the QIs couple to the, to the AIs that we get from dimensional reduction. Um, now, the supersymmetric solution determines the embedding of the gravity photon, which is some combination of the AIs, of the FIs, uh, depends the embedding of the gravity photon into the FIs. The gravity photon is the super partner of the graviton that's determined by the supersymmetric solution. And as is shown uh, in this solution, this tells us that the, uh, 
gravity photon is embedded this way into the Fi's. So we have these Xi's, and then this is W minus. So this is a crucial relation. This tells us what the gravity photon is as a combination of the field strengths Fi of the gauge fields that we have in the, um, in the four dimensional theory. And so the charges of the particles under the gravity photon, since the charges are Qi Fi under the Fi's, then that's just one half Qi X bar I W minus nu nu. And this combination is called uh, the central charge as a function of zi. So in other words, this is the charge is just the central charge here. Now, importantly, this charge is uh, this charge is complex, and this background field is imaginary. Okay, that's the calc that's so we want to just do a standard integrating out calculation like we did uh, like the textbook one, except when we couple in the covariant derivative, okay? Well in the covariant derivative, in the covariant derivative, we're gonna have a coupling like this, q i a mu i, then that's going to be half z bar q, and then the uh, the gravity photon that we're going to couple to. Um, when we do that coupling, this, the charges are going to be complex and the background for the gravity photon is going to be imaginary. Okay, so that's the subtlety of the calculation. Other than that, it's just a standard textbook uh, integrating out calculation. Okay. Are there any questions about this? Um, no. Okay. So now we, we want to calculate this effective Lagrangian. So uh, we have to perform the, the, the work to do is we have to do this trace. Okay. We have to trace over the uh, eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. Okay. But we have to be careful because the covariant derivative, which appears in this Hamiltonian is in this strange background with this complex charge and the uh, uh, imaginary back and the gravity photon. So forming the trace. So we need to calculate the trace of e to the minus sh, where h is just d squared, um, uh, the covariant derivative. Okay. If we can calculate the trace, then we put it into the Schwinger formula that calculates for us the effective action from integrating out the particles. And then we read off the free energy from the coefficients in front of the W. Um, uh, well, that is actually the free energy. What we'll get, the effective Lagrangian we get is the free energy. Um, so we need to do this calculation in R4. Okay. So remember, we did, we're looking at R4 times S1, but uh, the the kk we're going to we 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 consider kk charges under the s1 so with these are four dimensional fields for each kk mode we have a different four dimensional field and the kk charge of that field is what we call n that's the d0 contribution to the charge um but we can split this into a calculation in r2 times r2 that's because the gravity photon background we're, look, we're looking at doesn't mix. It has components along one, two, and along three, four. Um, so we can split this into two copies of a calculation in just R2. So we need to integrate out a particle, a charged particle in R2. Um, uh, this is actually a standard calculation. Uh, so we want to uh, do the trace of charged particle in constant and constant uh, magnetic background um, in, in R2. This is uh, a calculation which can be found, for example, in the, uh, I think, I think in the lectures of David Tong on the uh, quantum Hall effect. 
for example, but this is a classic calculation. It's a calculation of, uh, of Landau levels. It integrates that uh, a particle in a, in a, uh, in a two-dimensional uh, background with a gauge field. Um, uh, so uh, the solution, the, the, if we think about the energy eigenstate, energy eigenvalues, energy eigenvalues, um, if the charge of the, if we have a particle of charge E and the magnetic and the constant magnetic field, um, which is B, um, then the energy levels are given by uh, H bar omega B n plus one half, where n is in the positive integers. Um, and omega B is what's called the cyclotron's frequency, cyclotron frequency, and uh, it's given by Eb over m, where m is the mass of the particle. That's a standard calculation that can be found in any kind of uh, lecture notes on this uh, thing. Um, now, if we want to map it to our setting, then we should identify Uh, e b h bar is identified with this. Um, uh, the charge is z bar, e is z bar, b is the background gauge field. That's what we call the gravity photon background, that's w12 minus. And uh, we can set this particle uh, mass to be a half uh, because it's just a, we're just comparing it to the standard uh, lambda level calculation. So under this map, um, we find that the trace, sorry, the trace of e to the minus sh is then the sum over the energy. Uh, we're going to perform the trace in the energy basis of e to the minus s. And now comes the Hamiltonian, so the energy eigenstates, so en. But we can read off the form of these eigenstates from this general solution here and using this map. So that just gives, just gives us S, oh, sorry, Z bar W12 minus one half N plus one half. That's how we do the trace over the energy um, eigenstate. Now it turns out that there are subtleties to these calculations, subtleties, very important subtleties. Because this calculation of the lambda levels is for a real background magnetic field and a real charge. That is the textbook calculation. This map here, which is the crucial map that we used, equates the charge with Z bar, which is a complex quantity, and the background magnetic field with W, which is the gravity photon background, which is imaginary, okay? That means you have to do a little bit more work to show that this result is still true, that this uh, we can read off the result from this map, but uh, we've done that and that is still true. It's a bit more subtle how to show that that's true, but I don't have time to go into it at this point. Uh, maybe in the next lecture, I'll go into that a little bit more detail if we need to. Um, okay, so that's <clears throat> the trace. Now this was in R squared. So subtleties are to do with the E goes to Z, which is complex. And B goes to W1 minus tau, which is imaginary. Nonetheless, the calculation still holds. Now this is this this was in R2, uh, but we need the calculation in R4. So it's just two copies of this. So in other words, the trace of e to the minus sh is just the sum over n and m now, e to the minus s, n plus one half, one half z bar w1 minus like this. And then again, a copy of the same thing, n plus one half, one half z bar w12 minus. We can write this as a square. So sum of n, e to the minus n, n plus one half, one half z bar w12 minus squared. 
And we can rewrite this by factoring out an e to the minus s factor, a to the minus s z bar omega minus one, two over four. Um, by this factoring out this factor of a half, this uh, constant half here, sum over n of chi n, okay, the sum over n is from zero to infinity, where chi is e to the minus s, one half z bar w minus like this. And what is the idea? We now perform a geometric sum. So the sum n equals zero to infinity of chi n is one over one minus chi. Now, note that this sum is convergent only if the real part of z bar w1 minus 2 is bigger than 0. Um, but if you do the calculation more carefully of this Landau level calculation for complex and imaginary charges, you actually see that this is automatic. Uh, in other words, this is true. And if this was not true, then you would have had the opposite sign also appearing in the exponential. So the sum that you get is always convergent. So we can perform the sum using this, 1 minus x. And that then gives us that the trace of e to the minus sh is um, this factor that we factored out. And then 1 over 1 minus chi. So 1 over e to the minus s, 1 half z bar minus 2, like this. And now we have to remember that w. 1, 2, minus is imaginary. This is important, it's imaginary. And so let's remind ourselves by setting, uh, uh, by introducing the topological string coupling, lambda bar, as i over 2 times w. Um, that's that's the relation between the gravity photon field strength and the topological string coupling. We've written here a lambda bar. Lambda bar is just what we call the topological string coupling over 2 pi. That's just a convention thing. And so let's write this in terms of this topological string coupling. Um, this is equal to uh, e to the i s z bar lambda bar over 2. But now we have this i. This is important. Okay, and that's because we have to remember that we're doing the calculation in the imaginary gravity photon background. One over one minus, again, we have an i, z bar, lambda bar s squared. And now what is this? This is just equal to one over two i sine s, z bar, lambda over two squared. Okay, that's the trace over the energy eigenstates. Um, but we also uh, have an additional factor that we need to um, uh, account for that we won't get into the details. First of all, we have to, this is true for, um, uh, we haven't uh, uh, considered integrating over all the different space over us or out to the four. So we need to integrate over space. Okay, this is just the energy levels that we've integrated out. Integrating over space will mean that we have to we have to include a d4x, and then we have to include the degeneracy of these lambda level states in space. And lambda levels uh, have a degeneracy per unit area, which is given basically by eb squared. That's the standard result. Um, in our case, therefore, we're going to get a factor like z bar w1 minus 2 squared. And there's another thing which we haven't done, which is that we've shown how to integrate out a scalar field, but we actually are in a setting with n equals two supersymmetry. And so we have to not integrate out just a scalar field, but we have to integrate at what's called a hypermultiplet. That means it has a hypermultiplet has uh, four scalars in it, uh, plus uh, two fermions. Now, in the paper 1411, 
uh, this paper of Dedeschenko and Witten, they do this calculation carefully uh, uh, for the hypermultiplets. And all that this implies is that you get an extra factor of one over Z bar squared multiplying the whole thing. And so uh, with this Z bar squared that you get here, and this one over Z bar squared cancel, and so that overall, we get an extra W one minus two squared, which is gonna give us an extra factor of lambda squared or lambda bar squared in front of it. So what we're gonna get is lambda bar squared times this result uh, here, which is one over sine. So let me write it out. So then if we get the effective Lagrangian that we get from integrating out the state is going to be, there's this uh, integral over S, e to minus s m squared. And then we have this lambda bar squared factor that we've discussed. And then divided by two sine s z bar lambda bar over two squared. And the final thing we need to introduce is the fact that these are BPS states. And BPS states are such that their mass is equal to their charge. In other words, m squared is just given by the charge, which is just z bar squared. So m squared is just z squared. And so the effective Lagrangian that we get after we integrate out these states is, is this. Um, And uh, um, this is nothing but what we call the free energy then, okay? So we expand this out in lambda and that's how we can read out uh, the free energy. So that is, then that, that is exactly what we call F of uh, T and lambda. Uh, and the dependence on T comes from the fact that the charge Z is a function of the T, is a function of T. So this is the main result that I wanted to get to in the first lecture, okay? This gives us the free energy, okay? Uh, as a, um, uh, from integrating out one hypermultiplet uh, from, uh, that you get from integrating out a hypermultiplet uh, in terms of the topological string coupling. Now, the next step is quite simple. I'll just do it in the next, uh, uh, in just two minutes. Uh, this is coming from one hypermultiplet. But we have many such states from the D2D0s wrapping all the different two cycles. So we have to sum, we have to sum over all the states, all the different wrapping, all the different D2D0s that we can wrap in the Calabi out. And that will give us the four free energy. So what are the states labeled by? Remember, uh, they're labeled by uh, N, which is the D0 charge, the beta I, which is the wrapping number. And they also uh, are given by R, which is the genus of the curve that they're wrapping in the homology class of that two cycle. So I won't go into that too much. And given those charges, there's going to be more than one such state in the Calabi-Yau. How many such states are there? Their number is given by alpha, which is a function of R and beta. Uh, that's the degeneracy of those states of those charges. Okay, the beta I, if you like. Beta is a vector. This thing here is what's called the Gopakoma Rafa invariant. It's an integer. It's just the number of states that have, of the D2, D0 brains that have that wrapping number, okay? And so the full free energy is given by, uh, sorry. Um, uh, sum over these different types of states that we have to integrate out times their degeneracy, that's how many of them there are. And then the thing we just calculated, ds over s, 
e to the minus s z, which is now a function of the charges, beta n squared over two sine s z bar lambda over two squared. And the charge of these states is just um, given in terms of these ti's. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, like so. And that is the final result that we need that I wanted to get to. Um, uh, notice that I've switched the lambda to lambda bar here. The lambda bar has gone to lambda. Uh, that's to do with a certain rescaling you can do, rescaling of S. It's not very important. So it's like, a, I'll write it out, but we're going to discuss it. That's the rescaling of S goes to S times 2 pi squared. And then lambda goes to lambda bar. Um, uh, that is the final expression. Okay. So um, this is the Gubicum of Alpha formula. It's not quite the Gubicum of Alpha formula. It's a one step before it in some sense. Um, but we'll uh, do this step in great detail in the next lecture. Um, but this is uh, what we call the Gubicum of Alpha calculation, basically. Um, what one does is integrate out charged d2 d0 bound states on the Calabi-Yau. As we explained, if you integrate them out, you generate different, uh, you generate lots of terms with powers of the gravity photon, but the gravity photon is just the topological string coupling lambda. So we get this thing here. There are these, uh, the, the number of such states is given by these uh, numbers here, alpha. These are the group of of alpha invariants. Okay. Um, and uh, this is the formula that will give us then the free energy. This is a, this is a precursor to the group of of alpha formula, but the final step that you need to do to get to that formula um, we'll do in a lot of details in the next lecture, and that's where the paper that we wrote um, comes in. Uh, so, uh, yeah, are there uh, um, uh, yeah, sorry, there's one more thing I needed to add. One, I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, uh, what we did with the calculation we did was for a scalar field, actually. Um, if you're wrapping a genus R, uh, then you don't you get a higher spin field. It's not a scalar field; it's a higher spin field, and then you get a you do a similar calculation to what we did, but it changes a little bit. The only change that happens is that um, you get a different power of the sign here. So actually, you get two minus two R here. That's the factor I forgot to mention. Okay. So this is the Gubicum of Alpha. Uh, well, it's a precursor to Gubicum of Alpha formula. Um, yeah, and the yellow things, this this alpha r beta are what are called the, uh, these are integers, and they are the Gubicum of Alpha invariants. Gubicum of Alpha invariants. All right. Uh, that's it. That's all I wanted to say um, for this uh, lecture. Are there any questions? Um...